She's a doctor. Hi, I'm Dr. Dobek, and she's a dietitian. Hey, I'm Hannah Schuyler, and together we are the, the Doctor Dietitian Collab. So, what's new? What's new? Not a whole lot. What's new with you? Honestly, absolutely nothing. Oh, there is one thing that's new with me. Oh yeah, it's kind of big. It is. What is it? I'm going to have a baby. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, we've been dying to tell everyone. Seriously. Oh, it's been a while. How far along are you? 20 weeks. Oh, my gosh. Halfway, halfway there. there. Yeah. So do early February. Yeah. So your birthday is in early February. Yes. We'll see. If she comes late. It's a girl. Oh, I just goodness. ruined that. Yes. She. Um, yeah. If she comes a few days late. We might be birthday twins. Oh so my gosh! We'll how, see. how fun is that? How exciting! I know. Oh my She's goodness! Joining the girl gang. It is. It's a perfect thing for Team Body by Bariatrics yes. <laughs> here to have a female. The time is yes. now. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I can't wait for. I know. We're so excited. My oh. husband is like thrilled. I know. He's so excited. He is excited. I mean, I just, I just, I don't even know. I just feel like there's been so much like hype around this. It's been so hard for us to keep this a secret been. and under wraps. And, and it's kind of crazy, the timing of it. Cause I really like started with like the new job mm -hmm. and like I was pregnant within like a month or so of starting. I, I mean, it was so quickly. And so it was like starting the new job, being pregnant you know, just so much happening. There was so much happening, but um, that's what we really want to talk about today yeah. is all things women's health, all things pregnancy, yes. all things you being in this moment yes. of, of, you know, trying to get pregnant, trying mm -hmm. to conceive some of the things, you know, that you try to do and just... Yeah. The mind, the thing that it was, I know it's like, well, I got pregnant fairly easily. And I did. You yeah. Did. Yeah. It took just like, it was like three months or so. I know. Oh. And for a lot of people, I think that that's, I mean, that that's amazing. But even yeah. just three months, it's, it's still three it's times 20 days. Yeah, that moment of you do the stick and you're, like, looking, like, as closely as possible oh. at this, like, little thing. And, like, is that a line? Is that not a line? And then, or you go to test and you get your period Ugh. or whatever it is. But and of course, because I'm... A, nerdy and I was like I'm not doing this without some science help I was tracking I had an app like I was oh, you yes. know watching my my ovulation I started taking my temperature every morning oh, I mean like I said it was very early on but I think that's partially why it was so quick because I was like on top of it you're like I'm ovulating so, now yeah now. exactly yeah <laughs> this, is the, this is the moment this is the moment so um, and then you finally do get the test here after just a few months of the positive uh -huh. and I mean like that's like one of life's craziest moments it was and it was like a Tuesday morning or something you know because obviously you can't control because again because I was following everything I tested like the second that you could potentially have a positive on one of those tests like I was like woke up and went and did it and yeah, I was like, oh my God, you know, and then it was like, well, now I have to, you know, I mean, I told my husband yes, and uh, it's like, well, now I have to go to work. But then it was, it was like such a secret with just the two of us, which was kind of exciting and fun. But then I got really annoyed. I was like, I just want to tell everybody. I know. I know. Like, well, there's that moment where you were always going to be the first one that knows. Right. That yeah. You're just no like, one else can. Oh my gosh. Like I, I'm pregnant. Yeah. There's life inside Yeah, I me. knew for like five minutes before I told him because <laughs> I like went and made coffee. I'd bought him a, a mug that says dad. So I like went and made coffee and like brought him his like dad mug. And it took it because it was like I said, it was first thing in the morning. We were like waking up to go to work that day. And it took him a second to really figure out. He was like, oh, I thought it was like cat dad. <laughs> like, you like, already you're been already a cat. cat dad. That's not new. Oh, my gosh. So, oh, oh, I yeah, mean, it's been great. Uh, but tell us how have you been feeling like the whole. Honestly, I, I feel a little guilty because like pregnancy has been really easy for me for the oh most gosh. part. Um First trimester, there were some, there was like four weeks probably where I was just, I was just wiped. Mm -hmm. I was so tired. Um, don't tell my boss, but sometimes I would have to like go and nap <laughs> in the middle of the day. <laughs> she doesn't care. She doesn't um, care. So, I mean, it was just like, I mean, I couldn't. And after work, I would, I would nap for two hours I know. every day, pretty much. And I just couldn't, couldn't, uh function it's it's it incredible. was so crazy and but I didn't I wasn't sick I was super queasy and mm -hmm. actually it was really funny I was talking to a patient 
there's been a couple patient times where like things have been brought up and I'm like, I want to be able to tell you like, cause I like relate to them and stuff. Yes. So I had a patient who was, I don't remember eight weeks or so out from surgery and she was just struggling. She's like, every time I like go to the fridge and open it, like I just feel queasy. She's like, I don't feel like I need to throw up. I don't feel, but I just go in there and I'm like, nothing looks good. And I was like, totally and she's like yeah it's like when you're pregnant and I was like yes it's 100% how I was feeling like in that moment too so it was kind of funny Um, and and you know that's actually interesting I've said this many times but there are such parallels to pregnancy and having early post-operative bariatric surgery yeah like I I mean you're gonna see it now so so much in terms of oh um, in the beginning, like I just nothing sounds appetizing. Mm-hmm. I feel very nauseated. I'm super exhausted. The anesthesia wiped me out. And yeah, like, it's it's like it's exactly the same. Super parallel. Yeah, I know. And even before, like the preparation. Now you're mm-hmm. in this like we're we're embarking on the nesting phase, which I, as the boss, as you say, um, <laughs> am very excited for because now you're feeling better. Yeah, your energy's back. You're like, oh, I forgot how like bad yeah. I actually was feeling. Now I feel so much better. Right. And then all of a sudden, you're gonna be like in this mode of like, I got to get every, it's almost like the life is coming to a, well, a different yeah, turning point here. So sure. that you're like, I got to get everything ready. So I can't yes. wait to see what's coming out of you out, I know. in the next few oh weeks. Oh my gosh, we'll see. Yeah, stay tuned, everyone. Yeah. So today we wanted to really um, do a full, very long overdue podcast on all kinds of women's health issues, on PCOS, hormones, periods, on fertility in general, and then getting pregnant and what you should do. And we have a lot to really yes, plow through this here. Is a, this is a big episode. Mm-hmm. One thing I do want to note is we're probably going to mention a lot of things like women's health, women, pregnant women. We also want to recognize that there are people who don't identify or who are not women that do have these experiences. So uh, we are including those people in our conversation. I just think we are out of practice with using some of those terms. So we know there are other people that can get pregnant and they are absolutely included in this conversation that we're having today. Absolutely. So and um, let's just let's dive in um, after that big announcement and uh it's a girl. So here we go. And we're halfway there. So we're going to talk about life before bariatric surgery. Yes. And and honestly, this is one of the big reasons why people even look into having bariatric surgery mm-hmm. is that maybe they're of childbearing age. They've been trying for a long time with their partner, maybe even IUI, IVF, if they're um, same sex marriage and they want to get pregnant and they can't. Yeah. And it's just not working. And it's not happening. And they've been told well, if you'd lose weight, your fertility would improve and that sort of thing. And I want to start off with one of the biggest comorbidities that our females um, suffer through, and that is PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And we're going to talk a lot about how that presents in the symptoms, um, because I would say the majority of our patients are females have this. Yeah. And I think it's one of those terms, too, that, like, gets thrown around a lot of, like, mm. PCOS. And it's like, well, what does that really look like? So what does PCOS really present as? Exactly. And it's not just, oh, I want to have a baby. I can't because I have PCOS. There's women who maybe don't want babies, maybe um, are are done with having children, and they're still suffering from PCOS. Right. So there's a lot more to it than just fertility. So I want to first start off with, um, with your menstrual cycle, with your period. Mm-hmm. And I I think this is one of the biggest things, and this is actually one of the reasons we're going to talk more depth about why people like, whoops, I just had surgery a week ago and I'm already pregnant. And it's because your period will either be really irregular. You'll get um, very long spans of time when you don't have your period and then you'll get it and then it'll stop and then it comes back right back. And it's kind of all over the place. And it's going to be very, very, very heavy periods Mm -hmm. as well. Or you could have something called, and that's called oligomenorrhea. Right. And that means like infrequent or less few uh, periods. It's it's when your cycle between periods, it should be 28 days. We talk about the 28 day, like oh, every yeah. 20 days you have to check. But sometimes your cycle could be over 35 days. And if that's the case, then it is defined as oligomenorrhea. Now, if you have amenorrhea, that means that you don't have menstrual periods for for several months or more. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our patients, sometimes it's like, hey, I I ain't mad at this, but I'm not having my period. Right. 
And so that is one of the big things. And that's why when you're trying to conceive and you have PCOS, you were just talking about like, okay, I could, you know, I could track tests, yeah. like, yeah. you know, do these ovulation testing kits. You can pee on an mm-hmm. actual stick to see if you're actually ovulating. The right. egg is being released from the ovary and is ready to be fertilized by the sperm. But guess what? Sometimes you just like, it's you, like you, you have no idea. Track. Right. Because there's no, there's no set time that you think you're going to have a period and it might switch some days it might you know some months it might be more regular and some months it might be super far apart like so it definitely can vary a lot yeah it could be all over the place and in addition to amenorrhea you could have an ovulation an ovulation is when you're not ovulating mm. so you could be peeing on a stick every day and it's not never going to show anything it's not yeah. it's not happening so that's one of the biggest easiest ways to tell but there's also some other outward signs of PCOS as well and this is um, secondary to something called hyper androgenism and that means that you're going to have an excess amount of male hormones Mm -hmm. so when you think about men and differences in the the way we look one of the big things is is facial hair or hair that is coming excessive hair growth really in just areas it's not typically on uh, a born female and that would be on the face chin upper lip Mm -hmm. um chest back nipple areas abdomen we'll see sometimes quite a bit of abdominal hair that Mm -hmm. tracks up from sort of that pubic area up to the the belly button area yeah. um and sometimes that's tough you know that's yeah, absolutely that's something that you know you can wax and this is like trying to get rid of it or you know shave but it's yeah. it's 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 not fun so we know that that is one of the one of the big things here as well now it's called polycystic ovaries mm-hmm. because uh, there can be a lot of cysts mm-hmm. and uh I don't know if you've ever struggled or had lots of cysts, um, but they can be very painful. No, I've heard that, though, and I've known people that have gotten them, like, removed, like, surgically, and it's a big difference. Oh, yeah. You know, just in their stomach's appearance, because very the true. cysts can be so large that, like, you almost look pregnant. You know, if you're a smaller person, especially, they they really can... Oh, yeah. Show externally even. I mean, you can have huge cysts yeah. and then they can burst. And um, a ruptured ovarian cyst is uh, sometimes if it's a hemorrhagic cyst, it's actually a surgical emergency. It causes that much discomfort. If they're little guys, they can still hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, there's even uh, something that's outside of PCOS when you talk about like, oh, I can tell what side I'm ovulating on because sometimes you could have ovulatory pain. And that's mm. called, it's a German word. I'm going to butcher this. But I think it's <laughs> middle skirts. Middle skirts. Does that sound? And it sounds great to me. Okay. As a non-German speaker. That was always like one of my favorite things. Like, like, oh yeah. And like I said many times, I've gone through IVF. And when you do that, it's the the ovary that's gonna go, you know, you're trying to get a bunch of eggs out right. and they do the um the egg retrievals. And so I only had like, you know, a handful of eggs, but some people had a lot. And so when those afterwards, after they plucked all those, oh my gosh, it was was really intense. Oh yeah. yeah. It was intense. And you could tell like what side was like ovulating. You could tell what was happening. It was, it was a lot. So there's all of that. Now, this is where PCOS and bariatric surgery, particularly the gastric bypass, especially go hand in hand. And this is on those metabolic symptoms. Mm -hmm. So things like insulin resistance is all the same Huge, wheelhouse yeah. as this, the hormones, the PCOS, the cysts. And insulin resistance obviously means that your body is not as good at taking care of the, the blood sugar. So you could have higher circulating levels of blood sugar. Mm-hmm. You need more insulin to come onto the scene. The more insulin you have, it's kind of a growth hormone, the more that you gain weight. And so it all goes into this weight gain kind of cycle as well. And that's where it's really unfortunate because, like you said earlier, like doctors will be like, we'll lose weight and then you might be able to get pregnant. And it's like, well, I'm trying to lose weight, but I can't because I've got all these other problems going on. And it is it's like it's that old double standard of like, we'll just lose weight and everything will be better. And it's like, you think I haven't tried? Oh, my gosh. Well, no doubt. And that is something that um, I always think about, like, what is the chicken or the egg in a lot of these circumstances? Mm -hmm. Did you start to gain weight and then you develop PCOS and then the PCOS makes it so that it's harder to lose the weight and then you're stuck in that cycle. And the same thing with insulin resistance, which progresses to type 2 diabetes, which Mm -hmm. is all, you know, what's the starter of this is the PCOS. It's like all of these, all of these 
these really rough things. And then there's other metabolic issues as well. Yeah. Yeah. So things like, yeah, if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol. I mean, just these things that we see um, and just overall increased risk of cardiovascular issues, which obviously we don't want in the long run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And I and I think that's something that we don't really talk about enough mm-hmm. is that PCOS is a legitimate concern. And if you're feeling this way, you, you know, it, there's, there's so many things. And when you talk about weight gain, there's also skin changes. So whenever, you know, I'm out and about, I do look at something called anchanthosis uh, nigricans, which is a darkening of skin in certain areas. It's like Mm -hmm. a thickening and I can see it on people's necks. Yeah. Um, out in public, um, you might, if they're wearing a tank top, you can see like this thicker kind of like band of darker tissue that like, it's like a, like almost like a roll, but it's underneath their, um, underarms, like their Mm -hmm. armpit area. Um, and you'll see this, Almost like a like a hump that's like around like the like upper back neck area, yeah. which is all plays with this sort of overall picture of how it is. Yeah, yeah, and, the, the, and that's you know again these are things that really affect people. Yeah, absolutely. And and when we talk about it impacting your mood, depression, anxiety, mood disorders are very well associated with with the hormones, the estrogen. If you think about menopause, there's, you know, why do people even go into estrogen replacement therapy? It is because estrogen does make you feel better. And if you're just feeling just, I don't know, down and blue and it it confuses your hormones, you know, estrogen is a beautiful hormone. It it does some, some bad things if it's an overdrive, um, breast cancers, that sort of thing. But for the most part, estrogen you want those things to be in balance right in correct balance and then finally with the heavy or irregular menstrual cycles when you actually do have your period oh it can hurt to be painful very yeah. very painful like we already said it's called dysmenorrhea that's painful periods you get cramps the pelvic discomfort the fullness um all of those sorts of things and it can mess with your sleep so we what wouldn't what, what doesn't what, let's throw sleep in there guys yeah. like we, we we it wouldn't be us without without sleep yeah so pcos is a big one um hormonal imbalances metabolic issues all yeah. of these things can lead to infertility which again can be even very, without very frustrating. pcos like it's like yeah if you have the insulin resistance since you're having those kinds of problems, you know, you may not be diagnosed necessarily with that, but you may have a lot of these pieces of it. And I think the other thing with this is, and the reason that this is really tricky for a lot of people is, again, healthcare just never really focuses a lot on women's issues or it hasn't in the long, you know, if we look at, at history. And so I think a lot of this stuff, we're hearing much more about it, which is great because I'm hoping that that means more research is going into these things and people are actually, you know, listening to their patients when they come in with pain and they're not just saying, well, oh, you just have anxiety or it's all in your head or, oh, well, if you just lose weight, like, you know, and that's part of it. And I think that's where bariatric surgery can help to come in as part of like a treatment plan for this as well. And we'll talk more about, you know, the changes that do happen with bariatric surgery as well. Exactly. And and this also goes into other conditions like endometriosis, mm-hmm. which is where the endometrial tissue, which should be a, a, a line, aligning your uterus, which mm-hmm. is the endometrium is what gets shed with your period. Sometimes that endometrial tissue can be outside of your uterus. There can be implants on your ovaries. There can be implants along the um, peritoneum or inside the abdomen in different locations. In extreme cases, it can even line your uh, heart or even your lungs. There's um, cases where people get um, a hemothorax, which is um, a cl- accumulation of blood in their chest cavity. And I mean, there are case studies about yeah. it, but it was always like requiring a chest tube to drain the blood wow. from the endometrial implants inside of that. And the chronic chest pain, and it's like, why do I keep getting severe chest pain? And it's like, oh my, you have a hemothorax from that endometrial from your uterus yeah. endometrial cells moving that's crazy yeah it is and so and that's all fed by estrogen so that's like mm-hmm. an overdrive of estrogen and again hormonal imbalances can make your your and a lot of these things you try to correct it by putting you in the right balance of these hormones and so sometimes birth control can be very very effective at helping to kind of regulate just it just to get it started just to get it yeah. started and it's always very frustrating as an yeah. invert, in, 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 formerly infertile 
person to be told like, all right, we're going to start you off. We're going to do six months of getting you regular with hormones. And you're like, oh, yeah. birth control. Right. That's I the mean, last thing I want right now. <laughs> no, this is yeah. not, this isn't great. And so anyway, a lot of these fertility clinics and things like that, they're going to want you to get the PCOS under control. They want to get these val- hormones in balance and they're going to want to get your BMI down. Mm-hmm. So that is where in comes bariatric surgery. Yeah. And I mean, for some of you, you might be listening to this and you might still be very much so in the discovery phase of looking at bariatric surgery. You might be one of our um, long-term post-op veterans that has been there, done this. This is a, does not even apply to you. But I do want to briefly talk about bariatric surgery. So if you are listening to this mm-hmm. um, and you stumbled across us, know that there is hope. Bariatric surgery is the most effective tool that exists to get you more fertile. It's actually more effective than even IVF or anything that a reproductive and endocrinologist can do. It's that impactful, and it happens even before you lose weight. So, Hannah, from a dietitian standpoint and from all of that, can you explain what are the surgical options out there and what makes kind of like one better than another, if you will? Yeah, so like the two main surgeries that that are offered bariatrics are going to be the sleeve and the bypass. So the sleeve gastrectomy and the ruin wine gastric bypass. So the sleeve is where we trim your stomach down and we pull out the extra section and you have a much smaller stomach. And then the ruin wine bypass is where we're going to actually reroute your stomach, move some things around. You'll have a much smaller stomach pouch. And with the bypass is where you tend to see more of those hormonal changes than with the sleeve particularly. And now I will admit, I don't know why, that well, is, no one I don't does. know if any, yeah, exactly. I, was saying, I don't know if anybody does, but the bypass is generally, even for not, you know, this issue, but things like diabetes, um, it can be just the better option to help with any, di- all these different hormonal regulation, you know, hor- hormonal issues. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I think it's absolutely because so GLP-1, the glucagon yes. life peptide one, which is what's behind semaglutide, Ozempic, Wagovi, Monjaro is a piece of that. GLP-1 after surgery instantaneously increases. Mm-hmm. And that is what all those medications do. They're agonists to that. So they're also trying to amplify the impact of that. And I think, I mean, that's obviously something that we do know mm-hmm. all the amazing impact that that has and why those meds work so well. Yeah. It happens after and a lot surgery. of that is that it's that hormone and it's that insulin resistance that that really helps with this, my understanding with that too. For sure. So that I think, and just to briefly touch on that, I think that brings into the conversation as well. Like where do the meds play a role mm-hmm. in fertility and can we get some of those positive benefits, you know, maybe for some people who don't qualify for surgical intervention, who are struggling with like PCOS or infertility or things, maybe looking at can the weight loss medications you know, start to play a role into this. And I think we're learning more and more about those every day. I mean, new, new articles are coming out about weight loss meds every day and all these different benefits that they have. So I'm sure that's going to be something else that's looked into and we'll touch on meds in a little bit too. Yeah, no, I think meds are absolutely a great key who qualifies. If your BMI is greater than 27, you can do the BMI calculator and you have issues related to your weight. Or if your BMI is greater than 30, you qualify for medications. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of great ones. Like Hannah said, we are going to really dive into like, when should you stop them? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to conceive, you got to be very careful with some of them. Yes. Um, And, but some of them, there's just not a lot of great evidence. And I think that they're, I I think that they're safe and and we'll talk about that. So, all right, you make the decision. You're going to have bariatric surgery. You go through the process. It's not as hard or scary. (laughs) You you know, you have us, it's virtual, it's fairly easy. Um, And you have surgery. And now... This is probably our number one thing, which we have to add to our final preparation packet. A quick side note, but (laughs) is about what happens to your periods immediately after surgery. Immediately after surgery. So set the scene. What what do we hear literally from almost every patient? I got my period and it's so heavy and so intense. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. Am I dying? I'm bleeding so much. Totally. It's like, wow, I haven't seen it. Remember the amenorrhea? Yeah. Like I haven't seen this bad boy in months or years. Yeah. And I didn't even, like, I was even wondering, you know, I'm 45 years old. I didn't even know if I thought it was through menopause. Yeah. And menopause. And, and part of that, 
Right, isn't it? If you have had that amenorrhea, and so like the lining has just built up so much, like you just have an excessive kind of amount of lining, and so is that why you kind of get that big? I th- I don't know. actually that's I guess that something that's we should crazy. ask an OBGYN, but I mean we could they won't know probably, yeah. but I'm gonna say yes that that lining has just been kind of in a steady state, like just you know yeah, waiting developing. for something. Yeah, it's like on the cusp, and all of a sudden it's weird before you lose an ounce yeah you will have surgery on monday tuesday you're gonna call us yeah you're like bleeding heavily and then you're like oh my gosh i'm soaking through like the super heavies like this is uncontrollable and then you um you're like okay it seems to have gone away like all right i should expect it again in 28 days no (laughs) three days later guess who's back Uh back again you know like and it rears its head and it's really like it's a lot. It's concerning because yeah. it's, and then that also like you're not used to it, and that kind of wipes you out too. It does, and you're you're just recovering from surgery. Like that just that sounds like no fun. I know. So sorry, everyone who's gone through that. If it rains and pours, now the other side of that is also the patients who, like maybe they have oligomenorrhea, or maybe they're pretty regular. Like hey, even though I struggle with my weight, I don't have PCOS. I go, I have my period every mm-hmm. 28 days, and then those patients are like, I am clockwork, and they are very concerned of like oh my gosh I'm on my period can I still have my surgery yeah yes a lot of our patients pads no tampons and they have their surgery and then afterwards it kind of goes away and then oh my gosh like three days later it's back too yeah even if you're a regular if person really regular so regular non-regular you're going to be irregular in that early post-operative period so get ready um for all of that and then you're going to start to slowly but surely it might take just a couple of months. It might take several months. It might take a year, but you're going to most likely get regular after bariatric surgery. And it's, it's really, really interesting, um, as to, you know, how that happens or even more on the timing of when that all happens as well. It's, it's something that is interesting. So, you can ask your OBGYN. A lot of times they're a little bit afraid of our post-op area they expectations. Are. They are. That's okay. They don't want to do anything or say anything that's going to, um, you know, screw it up. But they'll always just send each other back. Yeah, we're to just one like, another. here, we're like, you go see your OBGYN. They're like, no, you go see your bariatric surgeon. So sorry when that happens. We know it's frustrating. Exactly. To get passed back and forth. Exactly. Pretty much. Yeah. So, okay. So your periods are going to be a little bit out of whack, and that's true. And then it comes to birth control. Hannah, do you want to do a PSA for the group? Please. Please use birth control after surgery. Now, you may be off of your, like, hormonal one for a few weeks after, right? You do four weeks after surgery to be off hormonal. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, let me, yeah. um, so if you are on birth control by mouth, this is what Body by Bariatrics does. Yes. But so, listen can, to your surgeon. Yes, listen to your surgeon, listen to your OBGYN. This is not a substitute for medical advice. Okay. If you are on an estrogen-containing birth control, you can just Google it and see if there's an estrogen Most of in there. the regular ones are, right? Exactly. You would know if you were on the progesterone sure. only. Yeah. Those ones are fine. Um, you might, like the mini pill, I believe it's progesterone only. Mm-hmm. Like, progesterone, all fine. If it has estrogen, it can increase your risk of blood clots. And so we do say, and I get it, this is another fun layer, is, and even if you're not using it for birth control, just the keeping it regular, ugh, I try to have patients stop it or hold it for two weeks before surgery mm-hmm. and then continue to hold your birth control for four weeks after surgery. Yeah. So yes, you're holding it for six weeks yeah. with our practice, which I think is one of the hardest things to do just because of all of this stuff. Well, yeah, you're also used to taking it. You know, that's a funny thing. So I was on birth control for a long time. Then I had an IUD. I, even while I was A, trying to get pregnant. And since I have been pregnant, if I fall asleep like early and then like before my normal time, I will wake up and think that I need to go take my birth control that I have not taken in like five years or something. Wow. Like I haven't been it's so, it's so, it's so it's like so... ingrained in me. Well, and I'm like, you are actively having a child. Like <laughs> you wanted this. Like don't take birth, don't take birth control. Hannah. Know. It's Nut. so ingrained in us. Like, but yeah, don't screw up. And now it's like, wait, I have a different thing. You know, this is good. Like, it yeah, is, right. It exactly. Messes with your mind. Well, and then the other thing is too, like a lot of times people feel much more like after surgery, they're like, when can I have sex? Cause like, I'm ready to go. And I'm like, you can, but please use protection. Like if you if you are having sex and potentially can get pregnant with that person, 
please be really safe and even using like two forms of of birth control. Yes, exactly. So there's different types of birth control, obviously, oral contraceptives. We just talked about it, some with estrogen, some with different amounts. There's um, some that even have iron included in them, uh, especially if you're already anemic or have uh, low blood counts um, before. There are progesterone only. There's the Depo-Provera injection. And I'm not a fan of it just because I do believe that Oh, progesterone is like the PMS hormone and it just makes you like irritable, moody. Mm-hmm. Um, you get, you do not get a period because it's the withdrawal of progesterone, which is what gives you your period. So PMS pre-menstrual syn- uh-huh. uh, syndrome is of course before you have your period. And then if you're, that's because of progesterone, the progesterone levels go down, you start to shed the lining of your uterus. So there's that, there's IUDs, as you mentioned. Um, those implants- don't have to be removed or anything. No. And those, those are generally still effective after surgery and everything. Yes, they are. They're- I mean, they're one of the most effective forms of birth control exactly in general they are and i and i have one patient who's so fertile she has five kids she knows who she is um and i uh, she did have and i don't want to put that out there but she was the only person i've ever known out of four thousand some surgeries that had the iud and got, and got pregnant. pregnant i mean it's it's not a zero percent chance it's not a zero. for anybody, no. sur- surgery or not. An IUD She's, is- so I feel like my level of, yeah. of IUD efficacy is on par with if you've had bariatrics or not. Yeah. So, and then there's implants um, mm-hmm. and there's, you know, there's different, and of course, condoms, barriers, abstinence, blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah. you, you know the drill. Right. Okay. So there are all of these things. So now you are deciding like, all right, this is the whole reason I did this. Yeah. Let's talk about the timing mm-hmm. of when you should start to try to conceive mm-hmm. after you have bariatric surgery. So please wait. Yeah. Please wait a little bit. So generally, the recommendation is 12 to 18 months after mm-hmm. surgery. And I would say that, you know, from my perspective, some of that is going to be how much weight you have to lose or that you want to lose. So if you maybe are somebody who's on like the smaller side um, or you lose weight quickly, maybe the 12 months is fine for you because you're not so worried at once you're pregnant about the weight anymore. Mm-hmm. But if you have more weight to lose, you know, and you get pregnant earlier on, that might really slow your weight loss down. Um, and so that would be when you might want to, one of the reasons you might want to consider waiting like that 18 months. Yeah. And you talk about weight loss, Mm -hmm. weight gain with pregnancy and it's a lot because now we are talking about like, Oh my God, I was trying so long not to get pregnant and then I'm pregnant. The same thing with like, I have been on this weight loss journey, this bariatric journey, and now I'm trying to get pregnant and it's like, how much weight should I gain? Right. How much weight? And so the guidelines for the normal weight, normal BMI category, um, say that the the average weight gain should be somewhere around 25 to 35 pounds throughout yeah. the, the entire 40-week pregnancy. And in the beginning, the first few trimesters, you're not gaining as much. And then right. and then as it gets towards the end, you're gaining like a pound or so a week. It's like, whoa, yeah. look at that. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is messing with me a little bit. So that is, if your BMI is between 18 and 25 right now, that's probably what you're going um, to gain. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're still, let's say you had 200 pounds to lose and your BMI is up and you're still in the losing I think it is totally fine and safe and kind of expected, even though this will really mess with your OBGYN, <laughs> is if you have, um, if you're losing throughout the entire pregnancy. The entire one. Yeah. Sometimes it's going to happen that yeah. way. If you have more to lose, like they'll say that if you're overweight or even obese, meaning be a migrant in 30, mm-hmm. then the target is 15 to 25 pounds weight, which is probably where you'll be. Yeah. Um, and it just all especially depends. in like the first trimester, you think about that time when, again, you, you a lot of women in the normal range do lose a little bit of weight in the first trimester mm-hmm. because they're sick because you know they can't eat anything like they're just kind of getting by yeah. on what they can and even like when I had one of my first visits with my doctor, I hadn't gained really any weight and and I was of course you know reading everything and blah 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 and he's like you're fine like if you were like a toothpick I'd be worried that you weren't gaining weight, but he was like, I'm not worried about it. Yeah. So it's, it, it, I feel like it always catches up. It's just like that right. first month post-op with, with surgery. Yeah. Some people, women will lose again, an average of around 
15 pounds, about a half a pound a day on average. Yeah. And some will lose 15 pounds in the first day and then not another pound for the next 29 days. Yeah. And it will be like, what's wrong? I'm like, but you lost 15 pounds. Right. And it will start again. And it's just like that with pregnancy. Like some mm-hmm. days you're like, I gained five to 10 pounds. And pregnancy is the only physiologic condition, if you will, that your body um, is designed to gain weight. You cannot help it. Yeah. Even if you're vomiting and not consuming enough nutrients and, and calories, like how am I gaining weight? I literally ate a cracker yesterday. Well, yeah, because there's other, and that's where I think it can get really tough. And, and this is something to consider for bariatric patients who have been so concerned about weight and have been generally so focused on weight for the past 12 mm-hmm. to 18 mm-hmm. months is yes, that's that's happening, but it's also, it's not always just weight. I mean, your blood volume increases by like 50% in the oh, first yes. two weeks of, surge, or of, of pregnancy. And so like your blood just weighs more, which sounds so weird to say, but it's, it's true. So it's like, there's also that difference between like true weight gain and like just some physiological differences that are happening in your body because you're pregnant. It's so true. Know? It has nothing to do with this, seed sized thing that's <laughs> in you cells. you know for sure did you um i think i asked you you didn't really feel it but could you tell like your circulating blood volume was going harder or more there were a few times where i was like out of breath like i would just do like i took i don't remember maybe it was when i was in chicago oh it was i was carrying like my backpack we were coming from the airport and we had taken public transit in and i like took the stairs with my big backpack on and i got to the top and i was like <laughs> like i just couldn't and then we went and saw beyonce that weekend and it was the yes. same thing because we were like way up in the high seats and so we had to like take all these stairs and i was like Woo! and then i looked on stage and she had this like very pregnant back like trumpeter i want to say oh playing and i was like I don't know how she's doing that because I couldn't get up the stairs to go see Beyonce. And I was like, what, like 12 weeks or so pregnant at that point. And this woman was like very obviously advanced because you could you could tell from from where I was sitting that she was pregnant. So I like, oh, I don't know how she is. She's doing obviously that. past she the, has, the terrible. Like, oh, yeah. And she's well conditioned to do that. I mean, she's got to have the lungs of. I don't know, an <laughs> elephant or something. Like she just has the strongest lungs of any oh, human. Oh gosh, I know, impressive. But I listen. You're coming around the yeah. bend here. You're that. This is you oh, too. Yeah. So let's talk about the timing also of whether to have bariatric surgery first or to get pregnant yeah. first, because people are like just with this whole weight thing. Well. I want to. I don't want to like lose all this weight only to gain and then have to struggle again. Yeah. The joys of being a woman, I always say. So there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of evidence and compelling research that really says that you really should have bariatric surgery or get into as close to fight and shape, healthy yeah. weight that you, the mother, can do in order to to get, to be able to do this safely. And there's a lot of reasons. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons for that. So Obviously, bariatric surgery leads to weight loss, and um, that's going to help to lower your risk of some pretty significant complications like gestational diabetes, mm-hmm. for one, um, gestational hypertension, which is also um, preeclampsia, or in severe cases, eclampsia, mm-hmm. which is where it's associated with high blood pressure and seizures. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the whole thing with gestational diabetes, we'll hear this from time to time, like, I don't have diabetes, but when I was pregnant, I had gestational mm-hmm. diabetes. Yeah. And... Diabetes is diabetes. It's, uh, you know, an increase in, in the amount of things that we've already talked about. And so um, we, so as part of your, your workup, and you should obviously go have regular checkups and make yes. sure that things are progressing, the baby's growing correctly, your, your, all of your labs and everything is on point. Mm-hmm. One of the big things is about the glucose tolerance test. At 28 weeks, baby. 28 weeks is when you will get that. And they're checking to see. And so what they'll do is a glucose tolerance. So they give you this big, huge swig of old glucose there how many ounces it is it's small it's small right it's like uh well that's a good point like a soda size like 12 ounces or so it's 12 ounces and it's It's got 50 grams of glucose in it i know that that's a ton right and so like our patients remember our most of our patients are keeping i'd say under 15 to 20 grams of added sugar per day right so this thing is having you ingest 50 grams of sugar at one time and like quickly like aren't you supposed to drink i'm i've obviously had mine yet yes 
you do it in like five minutes or something. You yeah. Oh, yeah. drink this thing down. Very, very, very quickly. Yeah. And it's like, it's low volume. It's so sugary. It tastes like McDonald's high C orange. Orange is the one I got for all three of mine. Yeah. And, um, I told you I loved it. I hate to admit that. But anyway, I mean, it's like just pure, like, like, oh, my God, it's just so good. good. Yeah, it's so super good. But anyway, so some of our patients, particularly the gastric bypass patients, number one, you brought up a good point with the volume of how many ounces you can consume at a time. Right. It's easier to drink after a gastric bypass than after a sleeve. So the volume might not bug you with the bypass, but... How your body is so incredible at really taking care of that huge amount of sugar, you could get some hypoglycemia. Right. You could get a little bit of dumping that's from this. What I, that's, that's the concern that I typically hear from people is the dumping syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there are alternatives for, I mean, that's like the gold standard for for gestational diabetes is to take, is to do the glucose tolerance test. You take it, you drink it, you wait an hour, they check your blood sugar levels and see what's happened. Mm-hmm. If you fail that, that's what they say, then you have to go back for the three hour test. It's another similar thing, but they check you, you do it and you check it three hours. Exactly. Um, and that helps to determine if you have gestational diabetes. So what I've read just from looking into this kind of stuff is that, especially like, and it makes sense, I would think for some people who have gastric bypass i would say especially if you know that you are very prone to Mm -hmm. dumping syndrome like if you're somebody who can eat a half a banana and it causes dumping syndrome like this might be really rough for you yeah but you can you know talk to your of course talk to your doctor about this this or your midwife whoever you're working with through your pregnancy um is doing like home glucose monitoring. Mm-hmm. So we're basically, you're pricking your finger, you have a glucometer, yes. you're checking that. Yes. I think, I, I don't, and I don't know if like insurance covers this, but I know some people have talked about getting like the continuous glucose monitors for mm-hmm. those couple weeks. And I think you have to do it for two weeks and you're checking your blood sugar like four times a day. Wow. Um, is my understanding from what I, again, I've just kind of lightly looked into it or heard things online and stuff like that. So, right, right. But yeah, you have to check it a lot and, and and be really consistent with it. And that gives you that like baseline of what your blood sugars would be. Yeah. So. And, and so, yeah, if you're concerned in the least that you're having this study, 50 grams of sugar at one time is causing you to have any issues, then talk to them about alternatives. Yeah. So other things um, about why bariatric surgery is so great. Well, obviously we've already said it, improved insulin sensitivity. It's a metabolic procedure, even, you know, so effective, even more than just the weight loss. Um, Now there's other things. You could have a big baby. Macrosomia is what it's called. And it reduces that risk of the baby being born with a high birth weight. And that can lower the risk of injuries with delivery. Right. You'd be more likely to baby have it vaginally, um, avoid having to have a C-section, which is a little bit harder of a recovery. It's a surgical Right. procedure, bigger incision, um, you're sore. It's, it's a lot going on there as well. And there's also some other um, issues uh, with, with the baby. Yeah. Too. So with, with looking at the nutrition after, and this is obviously something that people are always concerned about, because like, how am I going to get the right nutrition? But there's actually showing that, you know, you can have reduced risk of things like neural tube defects or things like, which would be like spina bifida anencephaly, um, which is due to the folic acid intake, Mm -hmm. which is why it's important to make sure that whether you are, you know, pregnant or not, your, your uh, bariatric uh, vitamin needs to, will have folic, a decent amount of folic acid in it, just like a prenatal vitamin would. Mm -hmm. And it's important if you are somebody who is planning to conceive that you are making sure that you are and this is bariatric surgery or not. Oh, yeah. If you are trying to get pregnant, you should be on a folic acid containing supplement for a few months prior to trying to conceive because it builds up your stores of it, which can really lower the risk of of neural tube defects. Yes. Um. So, and that's something that we get the question on all the time is, um, is the nutrition. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's definitely difficult. I think it's it's really challenging. Like we talked about, you might be really sick in the beginning. Yeah. A lot of times, too, the things that we recommend as bariatric, you know, providers are not going to be what you want to eat. I mean, I know I went through that early on. Did not put chicken in front of me. Like I did oh, not. I didn't yeah. want protein. <laughs> protein was like the last thing on my mind that I wanted, and I knew I needed it. I was doing shakes and stuff too to help. 
But, you know, a lot of times you wake up in the morning and you want something with some carbs in it. You Mm -hmm. want a starch. It really does help a lot of times. And I think that's where you eventually have to really learn, again, your body and your leniency that you have to, you're going to have to make some changes to the diet. Mm -hmm. And if you need to wake up, I mean, I woke up, I still do it. I have a piece of bread with peanut butter on it every single morning because it just helps Early on, it just really helped me, like, at least get my day started yes. with something. And it gave me the carb. It gave me the protein. It gave me a little the fat. Like, it, it it helped to just make sure I could actually eat that day, basically. Yeah. So, peanut butter bread, that has become a staple in our house. Um, well. So, so, trying to find the things that work for you as far as that goes. And then, again, taking the, the pro- proper vitamins. And the good thing is a lot of the vitamin companies do have prenatal bariatric supplements. So that's a really good thing to look into to see if that's something that you can find. I know Celebrate does those. And that's the key thing, to review the vitamins. Mm -hmm. Iron, which will be in your prenatal, Mm -hmm. it can be a little bit constipating, but it's important to know that the iron, and if you are post-bariatrics and you're on calcium, there are Mm -hmm. two plus divalent cations that compete for absorption. you got to separate them by at least two hours. Yeah. So we're always, we're a broken record on this, but if you're taking all this stuff at the same time, you are absolutely canceling it all out. Mm -hmm. So there's a proper way to take them. What should you take? When should you take it? How should you take it? I also think that when you come back in, if you're several months post-op, even if you're not on cycle at six months, one year, and then annually, which is when we check our nutritional labs, we check for six or 12 different things. And if you're not off on that cycle, we can check your labs again, just to say, yeah, all right, your B12 is less than five. 500, you should be supplemented. And by the way, we have our list of 12 things on our drxdietitian.com website. You can see exactly which vitamins you should have or nutritional levels you should have checked for blood work and then how to supplement them if there are deficiencies. So B12 is a big one. B1 or thiamine is a big one. Um, You want to make sure that your calcium is good. We look at that indirectly through PTH. Looking at iron studies, um, anemia is uh, a big one that could just happen and naturally Mm -hmm. um and that can folate can play into that one as well folic acid plays into anemia same with b12 Uh great point so you want to make sure that you have some baseline lab work that's nutritional that you are before you're trying to conceive if you can you're already on these vitamins Mm -hmm. and remember these are not just recommendations these are requirements yes absolutely and so you really want to be on all of those things and also actually Having bariatric surgery first is also reducing the risk of preterm birth. So you're more likely to carry a healthier baby to full full term. That's a normal size. The pregnancy, the delivery, all of the issues are easier on the mother and on the baby. Right. And that is, it, it's, it's a noticeable difference, a yeah. noticeable difference. So you really want to do all of that. And for nutritional needs at any time. Hannah Schuyler RD, here she is in the house. Oh gosh, she'll gonna have to become an expert on bariatric nutrition after for pregnancy. Well, you know about it, obviously. I just feel like you know it's interesting now that you're pregnant. It's just gonna make you a better clinician. Yeah, because now you are like, oh, I can empathize. Yes, looking at the fridge, there's nothing you like. Gosh, do the toast. Trying to get, I mean. I try to now, I started drinking, trying to get 100 ounces of water a day. Ooh, over a Which is a lot. Yes. I definitely am not hitting that daily. And then I was aiming for like more of like 80 to 100-ish grams of protein a day, which I've never been somebody who tracks my diet. It's just not something that, that I normally do. Mm-hmm. But to to think about it, I mean, there's definitely been days where I'm like, I just have to have a protein shake yeah. because it's the only thing that's going to, like, again, if all I can think about, if all I want is toast, I'm not going to get my protein. And of course, I've had, I haven't had surgery, so I am able to be a lot more flexible, you know, on some of those choices in my diet yeah. that I can kind of give in to like, well, that's all I want right now. But yeah, I've definitely had to to really be more intentional about it. And this mm-hmm. is something else that happened that was interesting, you know, kind of going back to the weight, you know, trying to get yourself in the best shape, getting yourself into fighting shape to get pregnant and mm-hmm. all of that, you know, leading up to, to getting pregnant. I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was necessarily on like a weight loss journey, mm-hmm. but I was definitely always very conscious of it, mm-hmm. trying to kind of at least maintain where I was at. Um, if not lose a few pounds, you know, just uh, prior to to that. And like that day that I got that like positive pregnancy test, it was so interesting because it was like just a switch went off in my head that was like, okay, we're done with that. Like we can't focus on weight loss anymore. We are now like, which I was trying to nourish my body before, but you know, it was like all of a sudden that just changed of like, all right, nope, 
different shift now yeah. of course all best like plans you know do whatever they want but uh well I so gotta it say was like I did what I could and I've taken a prenatal for a long time and I do do, do that religiously I still take a prenatal yeah. every day and I mean, <laughs> oh okay yeah, yeah I would do because like eggs weren't always the thing also you have to eat a lot of things to get enough choline Okay. For the new recommendations. Oh, choline too. Yeah, Jeez, and it's not oh, included in a lot of the prenatals. So oh. something just to look out for. I there we go, choline. Okay, yeah. I would do um, a B complex mm-hmm. and a prenatal. Okay, and then I was doing like coenzyme Q10. Yeah, I'm sure too with your with yeah, everything. Oh they probably were monitoring it. All of these it like things. it was a lot different because I know sometimes they'll put on. Like magnesium. As yeah, well I wasn't on. People. I wasn't on that. Yeah. But yeah, no, you're right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different, a lot of different things nutrients that you got to be very, very careful yeah. of. But like I was going to say, you look better than ever. Yeah, it's like glowing. <laughs> like the 20 week pregnancy is like the yeah. look. Like if you're gonna like, did you see those headshots of Hannah, guys? Like, yeah, that is where you're like glowing and you're like, you know, you're like yes. There's definitely some pictures in there that Spanx couldn't hold baby girl down, though. I know. Like, our little, um, our, our cover picture for this yeah. episode. Like, yeah. oh, this, this cute look on her face. Pop. A little pop. Mm-hmm. I know. I just love it. It's like, wow, look at, look at, look at myself. I know. It, She's really, like, showing up this week. I haven't oh, tried I my jean shorts on in a while. I'm a little bit afraid. Oh, my gosh. Hang them up. Button. Right, guys? Yeah. Right fans? I mean, we're like, hang them up. moving into our comfy clothes era. Oh, for sure. That's yeah. why you're going to love the maternity, although we're in Florida. So I used to love it for like warmth and everything, oh, yeah, too. Like, like, the, like big, the big waistband and yeah, stuff. Yeah, that goes yeah. up to underneath your boobs. I love yeah. that. I just bought like a big like jumpsuit. Mm. It's very, very maternity and I love it. I'm obsessed. I haven't worn it yet. I just got it the other day. I can't wait to see this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Times of pregnancy clothes. So yeah. we should do a whole one on like oh, it's keeping stylish through pregnancy. Stylish I should... though. So no one wants to follow me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, yes, we do. We, we care for I every Dr. Dr. X dietitian t-shirt. <laughs> That's what I'm wearing That's what right wearing now. Today. Oh my gosh. I know. Well, we could keep going. This has been like super great. And if, as always, you have any questions or you want more information about anything we discussed or maybe didn't hit on that's a women's health or anything like that, please um, DM us or, you know, write to us. As we were preparing for this episode, we just kept writing stuff down. And like, I mean, the fact that we prepared for an episode, go us. I know. You know, we did. But, you know, we were like, this could be, this could be 10 episodes. So we know we just kind of skirted, skated the surface on Mm -hmm. some of these things. Things. Um, so absolutely, if you want us to talk more about anything, we're happy to, you know, maybe we'll do a follow up on this one with everyone's questions. That'd be an awesome one to do. Yes. Just kind of answer some questions that you might have about fertility, bariatric surgery, the weight loss meds. Oh, really quickly. Let's talk about oh, when yes. do you need to stop weight loss medication. So fentramine is a controlled substance. It's a sympathomyometic amine. If you're trying to conceive, don't take it, period. In fact, yeah. um, you need to have a negative pregnancy test in order for us to prescribe you it. Yeah. So we we check on that. We'll verbally, we'll, we'll put it in writing. We'll give you the risk that you cannot, cannot be pregnant if you're on fentramine, which is also in topiramate or fentramine plus topiramate, which is Qsimia. Yeah. So that's a big no. If you're trying to conceive, you want to be very careful. Orlistat, we never really prescribe that. Yeah. Um, but also the big DLP1s, the Ozempics, all those things, they're great because they improve your blood sugar and they kind of get you regular. Um, but there's right now... I think the FDA is calling it like Class C or something like that, where there's not a lot of great um, evidence on animal studies that show whether there's actual damages or issues with the fetus. So because of that, they're saying that once you know you're pregnant, you got to stop those. Yeah. And if you're trying, they say try like up to two months beforehand, you can stop those. I think that's what the manufacturers are kind of saying. Yes. You know, again, it's one of those things that you can't really study a lot of stuff in pregnancy because it's just ethically you not right. I mean, yeah. you can't get have people be pregnant and then you test drugs on them like right, it's right. not ethical so that's kind of the hard part like you said it, I'm, and again I'm sure that all of this stuff is being studied is being developed oh, yeah. because these are big topics but um, once that information is out there hopefully we can get an update for you once once there is an update for but sure right now it's just a Better not risk it. I know, which is, yeah, better not risk it, which is really, I have fertility specialists that reach out to me sometimes. Yeah. I'm like, well, why is that? And 
I'm mean, like, well, I think it's like a big question mark. Yes, so, like you said, yeah. so again, not a great answer. Um, and maybe even your endocrinologist might even tell you to re- remain on it. Yeah. I mean, and so I think that, or if that's what they say, because some people will do like metformin or something like oh, that. Like, yeah. I know it's not ideal, but you know, something else just to help with like the insulin levels and things as you look at that. Exactly. I'm not a, I'm actually not an endocrinologist. You're not? No. Well, right. you'd make a great one. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. You would. Yeah. You're amazing. So, All right. Wow. All okay. right. Here we go. Well, good. We'll reach out. You know where to find us. We're on Instagram at Dr. X Dietitian. I'm at hannahskyler.rd. She's at Dr. Dovic. Send us a DM. Uh, we'd love to answer all of your questions. Check out our website, drxdietitian.com. You can check us out on YouTube. We're everywhere. Love to hear from you. And we'll see you next week. Congratulations to Hannah again. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.